This is a lecture on internal variability or dynamic variability. So I'm going to start out with a couple of questions just to keep in the back of your mind. Is weather random? Is weather predictable or is it unpredictable? Do I have to be able to predict weather to predict climate? One way to think about climate, climate variability, weather, weather variability, I think is to use our intuition and our experience that we know that there are persistent patterns of weather. We have rainy periods, we have dry periods. We experience these really every year. I think if you were to look up some of the documentaries that are on the great flood of the Mississippi River in 1927, one of the things you will hear in that description is the relentlessness of the rain over large parts of the Mississippi Valley and the Ohio River Valley. And then we have periods of, of drought. You don't have to look back very far to hear about discussions of drought and mega drought in the western parts of the United States. Therefore, we all have this sort of intuition that there are weather patterns that are sometimes dry and sometimes wet. And I think it's pretty obvious that during those times, the weather does not appear random. And in fact, you might say that the weather appears relentless. There is a simple example of variability that, again, we all intuitively have realized, and that is the march of the seasons. We are familiar with winter, summer, and followed by winter. We are familiar with it being basically cold in the winter, warm in the summer, cold again in the winter. We are familiar with the idea that it can be pretty messy and variable going from winter to summer. Things like all of the flowers start to bloom and then there's a frost that kills them all, that sort of messy variability. Some of us who study weather a little bit more, and you don't have to be a scientist to notice this, notice that in the winter, rain, precipitation, comes in a different way than it does in the summer. In the winter, rain comes in these big frontal systems. Those are actually relatively easy to predict at this point in time. In the summer, rain comes in smaller systems of thunderstorms, sometimes very isolated thunderstorms. And these are not as easy to predict as the winter storms on an event-by-event -event basis, However, we've become pretty familiar in the summer of the ability to predict the thunderstorms in a statistical or a probabilistic way. But the real point to make here is that we have these seasons. Winter is cold, summer is warm, rain comes in different ways, and we can develop an intuition of the atmosphere not really working in a random way, but in a way that is, at least on a broad sense, ordered. So what happens when we go from winter to summer? This is a little bit of an aside. What happens to temperature? What happens to carbon dioxide? And one of the reasons I want to show this is to demonstrate again intuitively temperature and carbon dioxide are not correlated at the 100% level. They're very strongly related to them. However, each of the quantities, temperature, carbon dioxide, have other causes of their variability that can influence each of them on a short time scale. So what happens to temperature going from winter to summer? It heats up. What happens to carbon dioxide? it goes down. That's what that looks like here, and in this case, carbon dioxide and temperature are anti-correlated. Their correlation is really quite close to minus one. And this is because the temperature on this time scale 
is being forced, a word that we've used many times here. It is being forced and responding to solar heating, and the carbon dioxide is responding to that solar heating in an interesting way because that solar heating is causing the growth of plants in the northern hemisphere, and those plants are using carbon dioxide. Again, I introduce this only as an example of the complexity of the relationship between temperature and carbon dioxide. They are not always correlated. Putting that basic concept of weather, weather patterns, the intuition that we have wet periods and dry periods, the intuition that we develop with the seasonal progression from winter to summer, we can start to develop a framework for this idea of internal or dynamic variability. We can view weather as single events. They are often described as waves waves in the atmosphere or vortices like a hurricane or a tornado. We can consider them single events. There are other ways, however, that the atmosphere, and I should say the atmosphere, the ocean, and the land, and the ice organize. The way that this organization emerges is what has influence on those weather patterns. And these are what we call modes of internal variability. I will also call them dynamic variability because they have a change over time. And you can see interrelated processes in that change over time. And these modes of variability are large enough that they cause measurable changes in the global surface atmospheric temperature. A number of these are El Nino, La Nina, the Arctic Oscillation, the North Atlantic Oscillation, and the Annular Mode, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, variability associated on decadal timescales with the Pacific Ocean, and there are other modes of variability such as the Indian Ocean Dipole, and there is variability in the Atlantic that is likely related to the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, or something that's more intuitive to many of us, the Gulf Stream and how it transports heat from the south to the north. I want to go through three of these. The first one is El Nino-La Nina. And the El Nino-La Nina phenomenon is something that is observed first and foremost in the eastern Pacific Ocean. So in this figure, here's North America, here's North America, here is the Pacific Ocean. During El Nino, the eastern part of the Pacific is quite warm compared to average, and if you look over here, the western part of the Pacific is cold. The figure that's actually shown here is sea level height. And what you're seeing is a difference on this scale of 14 centimeters above an average to 18 centimeters below an average. That is a span of about 30 centimeters or one foot. As we know, warm seawater has higher sea surface height than does cool seawater. Hence, it is a proxy measurement for temperature, and what you see here is the warm water in the eastern Pacific, and then when we have the La Nina condition, we have the colder water in the eastern Pacific. Therefore, you can see this as dynamic variability of sloshing of warm and cold between the eastern and western Pacific on the equator. You can see this as an oscillation of low and high sea level. And this appears to be an atmospheric oceanic coupled oscillation. Therefore, you're seeing the atmosphere and the ocean moving in a correlated way. And this has measurable impact on the global mean temperature of the planet. 
This is the famous El Nino La Nina of November 1997 here, going to February 1999. And the 1997-98 El Nino is one of them that was considered to be especially large and is sometimes now called a Super El Nino. And there were other Super El Ninos, one in the early 80s, and then the most recent one was in... 2014, 2015, 2016, that time frame. This next figure is a GIF animation of the 1997-98 El Nino versus what was emerging in 2015. So you'll see in this animation, 2015 stopped in October, so we can see what was happening. But the one to really focus on is this animation for 1997 where we see this warming in the eastern part of the Pacific Basin. You can start here in early 97 you see this warming forming, you see it spreading along the equator and you see it start to grow and as it grows it propagates up the coast and this is one of those situations where you can imagine with these changes in sea surface temperature up here that it's going to influence the weather along the western coasts of Mexico, the United States, and Canada. One of the things that El Ninos do is to cause a spike in the global temperature record. We're going back here to the GIS, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies temperature record, and here's 2018, and I've circled the 1997-1998 El Nino to show the big spike that it caused. And then there was this big spike, was followed by this decline, which would be, in this case, the La Nina part of that. And then you'll see it comes back up. And this was the subject of a great public communication issue and... I will come back to that in another lecture on internal variability and the interpretation of the temperature record. All I want to show here is that El Nino has a measurable and important effect on the global temperature record. However, it is transient. It is transient. It is dynamic. It's a spike caused by dynamics often followed by a global temperature minimum as we move over into the other stage. As I said, there are some other large El Ninos. Here's the one in around 2015. And then there was one in the early 80s, which we can see here. Here's a time series of an index that is used to measure El Nino. And all I want to do with this time series is to show you the both the periodic nature and perhaps the irregularity of that periodic nature. This is a time series going from 1970 to about the year 2000. The orange here is showing this index based on the eastern Pacific Ocean temperature and the El Nino periods where it is warm, and you can see that it's warm up to two, almost three degrees above average. And you can see in the La Nina period that it is colder than average. And you can see that there is some reliability that it goes back and forth between El Nino and La Nina. However, you can also see that it's not especially regular in terms of its time, so it's not like a pendulum of a clock in terms of its regularity. And you can see also that a El Nino is not necessarily followed by, let's say, a comparable magnitude cold phase in a La Nina. So there's a lot of, of variability, there's a lot of structure in this phenomenon than this oscillation of El Nino La Nina. El Nino La Nina is the most prominent, most familiar global variability on the two to seven year time span. During El Nino, the Earth is warm. During La Nina, the Earth is cool. 
And that's really the, perhaps the takeaway for most discussion. El Nino, the Earth is warm. La Nina, the Earth is cool. And this is a dynamic event. It's reasonably well understood. It is a source of variability, and it is a source of variability, or perhaps noise in the global temperature record. If it's noise, since we know its source, it's something we can account for and remove. Also important, weather patterns all over the planet change with El Nino. Famously for those of us in the United States, the rain in the winter time in California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and British Columbia is quite strongly related to the state of El Nino. In particular, whether the rain patterns, whether these phenomena that we call atmospheric rivers now, hit our coast in California or Washington or in the Gulf of Alaska. There are also important impacts in Africa, and El Nino and La Nina are used in our efforts to do seasonal projections and guidance for, for example, agriculture. I want to look at one of these monthly temperature figures that comes out from NOAA. This is January 2011. And what I want to show here, these are anomalies again. These are anomalies from a 1971 to 2000 base period. So we took an average of 71 to 2000. Now we're taking a difference here. And all I want to show in this figure right now is over here in the Eastern Pacific. Here is what one might call a characteristic pattern that would be associated with La Nina because here it's cool. I want to step away from El Nino and La Nina to move to other patterns of weather. Again, this idea of their weather patterns when we have persistent weather, I think is generally fairly intuitive to people. So the next figure is a common winter weather pattern, an atmospheric wave. And it's a wave that if it increases in amplitude, then high temperatures are likely to be higher. Low temperatures are likely to be lower. And these waves, since they grow and decay, again, are going to have a transient effect. That is one that changes in time. And perhaps over a certain period of time, they average out in terms of their influence on the mean field or the climate. But here's a wave pattern where this dashed line I'm representing as maybe the normal amplitude of the wave, and the, the darker line is the increased amplitude of the wave. The air in this part of the wave is cold. The air in these parts of the wave is warm or hot. What happens when this wave grows is this warm air moves up in this direction. The cold air pushes down in this direction. Warm air pushing up over here. And if you imagine this going from south down here to north up here and it being winter time, then here's up here perhaps your cold polar air, here's your warmer subtropical air. And what the atmosphere is doing here is trying to remove these temperature gradients, moving things from high to low. This is quite a common weather pattern in the United States where you can imagine Michigan or Washington, D.C., somewhere in the eastern part of the United States, being down here, Greenland and Alaska over here. And these are responsible for cold air outbreaks, what we've been calling since about 2014, perturbations of the polar vortex. They've been known forever as cold air outbreaks, sometimes Alberta clippers. They're a lot of different colloquial names for the intrusion of cold air into the eastern part of the United States. The behavior, these intrusions, this wave pattern, the alteration of the wave pattern, can be described or related to something that we call the Arctic Oscillation. Sometimes you see it called the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is a particular 
characteristic of the broader idea of the Arctic Oscillation. These are known sometimes as annular modes because they tend to, let's say, form circles around the poles in both the northern and the southern hemisphere. But then every now and then those circles become distorted and wobbly. That's the annular mode. But if we stick with either the Arctic Oscillation or the North Atlantic Oscillation, we have a situation that's something like this from this figure from Lamont Doherty, where in the positive phase, the positive phase, then this low pressure system up here at the pole is strong. The wave pattern is relatively low amplitude. And in this case, the U.S. east will be mild and wet. Europe north will be warm and wet. The northern part of Canada and Greenland, cold and dry. And this is called the positive phase. It is when this low pressure system here is strong, which means the polar vortex is, in fact, strong and circling the pole more than in the negative phase when this low is weaker. In the U.S., there are cold air outbreaks. It's snowy because of these cold air outbreaks, but it is, in fact, in terms of the amount of water that's coming in, it's, in fact, dry. Europe, the northern parts are cold, the southern parts are wet, and Greenland and Alaska tend to be warm. If we go back to this figure that I used with El Nino and La Nina, the January 2011 temperature anomalies, then here is what the Arctic Oscillation looks like in these monthly temperature maps. These cold air outbreaks, these cold periods, they are especially prominent here over the eastern part of the United States and then this much larger one over here in Siberia, in central parts of Asia. Similar to El Nino-La Nina, there is an index that indicates whether you're in the positive or the negative phase of the North Atlantic or the Arctic Oscillation. This is the North Atlantic Oscillation. This comes from NOAA. And all I want to show here is if you take a time period such as, say, this one, this is 1989, 1990, 91, 92, 93, the North Atlantic Oscillation was in this positive phase persistently for a number of years. Then in 1996, 97 through 98, you can see it was more commonly in a negative phase. It's difficult to see any trends in these, and because these are what we call nonlinear in terms of its dynamics, when things are nonlinear, they become more difficult to predict. And I would say that we do not have a full understanding at this point of what causes these persistent periods of positive or negative phases in the Arctic Oscillation. It is also currently a topic of considerable research of how the Arctic Oscillation might change in the future. The Arctic Oscillation is the most prominent, most familiar northern hemisphere variability on scales of days to months. It's important to weather in the Great Lakes and eastern North America. There is a question, does this get stuck in one mode or another for a year? If it does, then you have a pattern that if you are, say, in Michigan and you're in the negative phase of the Arctic Oscillation, it's going to seem very cold for a long period of time. And the question arises, does this change? Does the behavior of the Arctic Oscillation change with climate change? The answer to that is almost certainly it will change in some way, but I do not think that we fully describe how that will change at this point in time with our capacity for modeling.
The Arctic Oscillation, like El Nino, offers us great communication challenges because suppose there's a cold period and it's snowy in Washington, D.C. Suppose you're a politician or a citizen or a journalist. How do you interpret this variability? This figure is from Jim Hurl, who at this point in time was the director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And he was called to Washington to testify, I think in 2011 here, on why the winters were so cold and at some level why did scientists persist in claiming that there was global warming when the winters were so cold. So this figure shows changes in winter temperatures and they are presented as differences relative to a 1961 to 1990 average. Here are some winters in 1978, 79, and 1980. Here are the winters of 2010 and 2011. And one of the things that becomes immediately clear in here is this is a time of a cold air outbreak. This would be a time of a negative Arctic Oscillation or a negative North Atlantic Oscillation. And you can see how much colder it was in 1979 and 1978 than it was in these winters of 2010 and 2011, which in the moment felt cold and were viewed as of significant enough event to ask, say, Jim Hurl and several others to come and testify before Congress about how could it continue to be cold in the winter if the planet was warming. In this, you see what I was talking about in terms of variability, that if it is cold here, it's warm up here. Many times you'll see that if it's cold here, it's going to be quite warm over in Greenland. I think, however, that one of the interesting takeaways from this figure is how much colder it was in the 70s. And if you look in the more recent times here, how much warmer it is in 2010 and 2011. And if you look at these figures through a lens like that, you will see that the cold air is getting to be a smaller amount of area. And the intensity of the cold air in terms of how cold it is over how big an area is getting smaller, it becomes very obvious about how much warmer it's getting up in northern Canada, Greenland, Alaska, and similarly on the other side of the globe in Siberia. Going back to that index that I showed earlier, I took in place 1978 and 1979, the two very cold winters in the previous view graph, and 2010 and 2011, the winters that were more recent in that graph, and point out that the index was large and negative, in 2010 and 2011. However, that was not as cold during these winters in this period. Therefore, the presence of a negative Arctic index will tell you that it is cold, but it's not going to tell you how cold it's going to be. The last mode of variability I want to talk about is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and it's one of several oscillations or observed modes of variability that are important to weather and climate on longer time scales than the Arctic Oscillation and El Nino La Nino. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation looks like this, where in one phase it is warm along the coast of Alaska, Canada, North America, down to Mexico, and in the other phase, it's cool here. And when it's cool, there tends to be less rain on the west coast of the United States. Hence, we have our biggest, longest droughts. And when it's warm here, we can get a lot of rain, a lot of precipitation, a lot of snow accumulation along the coastal mountain ranges. This oscillation is related to El Nino. You can at times see when you have an El Nino and you see that warm water, 
you go back to the animation earlier, you saw it start to propagate up the coast. You could reasonably hypothesize that as you go forward, you get a remnant of an El Nino that might take some time to propagate across the Pacific as a warm anomaly, for example. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation is characterized by time scales, as the name says, in terms of decadal, often associated with 20 to 30 years. It does not have the influence on the global temperature record that El Nino does on the short term. However, during those periods of the positive or negative phase of this oscillation, you will see 20 or 30 year times when the planet is generally cooler or generally warmer, which again in the lecture that is on variability and its presence in the temperature record, I will show a figure. I talked in some detail about El Nino and La Nina. There's a figure at the end of the PowerPoint presentation for a little more information on the weather effects associated with El Nino and La Nina, the Arctic Oscillation, and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. I'll mention the Indian Ocean Dipole. It's sometimes called the Indian Ocean El Nino. It's an east-west oscillation of sea surface temperature. Like El Nino, it is erratic in terms of its periodicity. And then I will mention the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. The Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation is associated with observations of temperature anomalies that persist in the Atlantic for 50 to 90 years. And it is a controversial as to whether this is an oscillation, partly because we really don't have that many observations of many periods of, say, something that has a 90-year lifetime in the Atlantic. Therefore, the interpretation of this as an oscillation, its relation to the Atlantic meridional overturning, these are issues of science, scientific investigation, and though they are controversial, that does not mean that the fact that sea surface temperature has an influence on flood, drought, and hurricanes can be dismissed. If I were to put together a little figure here, it's a time scale figure I often used, where I'm declaring that 50 years is a long time scale. This is not based on geology or climate, but it's based on humans, our lifetime, and our ability to plan. These Sources of variability, the Arctic Oscillation, El Nino, La Nina, and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation all have influences down here. Up here we have the Atlantic Meridional Overturning, ideas of abrupt climate change, and these would be perhaps considered long on our time scales to plan. These would be more incremental these would be more disruptive, and these offer us a special challenge in planning that we have not really gotten to the point of thinking about how we would manage that. And what we often think of right now is how do we keep the climate from getting into a place where we would have higher likelihoods of big changes in Atlantic meridional overturning or other sources of abrupt climate change. Summary points. These modes of variability are important to our ability to improve predictions on time spans of seasons to decades. Weather patterns are often responding to persistent patterns of sea surface temperature. Internal variability is a large source of uncertainty in climate planning, especially on time scales of less than 20 years, and especially on regional spatial scales. Knowledge of internal variability is important to planning for climate change because local and regional planners are often familiar with, for example, El Nino. Therefore, a knowledge of El Nino and its influence on local patterns is important for establishing credibility with planners. Local effects on temperature and precipitation are a measure of model quality. 
the model might represent El Nino, but is it representing the persistent weather patterns on a local scale in some place like Tampa or San Francisco or Namibia that is observed in the observations? The answer to that is often no. Therefore, the models are likely to represent these large-scale oscillations more robustly than local weather, and they become guidance in your planning, but they also are important in the uncertainty description that we probably are relying upon historical relationships between El Nino and local weather rather than what the models are revealing. These modes of variability interact with each other, they interact statistically, and they interact physically. These modes of variability will change as the climate warms, that is, they are not fixed natural variability. And again, in some of the discussions and arguments about climate change, you will see some debaters speak of them as if they are fixed natural variability. And that is the conclusion of this introduction to internal variability.